Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Material Transfer Agreements for Early Career Professionals, presented by the Federal Laboratory Consortium for Technology Transfer. All lines have been muted to ensure high quality audio and today's session is being recorded. If you have any questions for the panelists, we encourage you to use the chat box available on your toolbar. My name is Samantha Updegraff and I will be your moderator today. I'm Senior IP Patent Counsel at Sandia National Laboratories. I've been at Sandia for about six years now. Um, I primarily work on IP and tech transfer matters, including licensing agreements, CRADAs and SPP agreements, non-disclosure agreements, uh, memorandums of understanding, and any other tech transfer IP type agreements. Um, prior to Sandia, I worked at various law firms local to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And today's speaker, dis distinguished speaker is Bob Charles. He serves as Chief Medical Research Law at the U.S. Army Medical Research and Development Command with its six designated laboratories and multiple research entities worldwide. From 2002 to 2011, he served on the FLC Executive Board as Chair of the Legal Issues Committee. Since 2007, Bob has taught the Creative Workshop at the FLC National Meetings as part of the training for tech transfer professionals. He was the editor of the 2009 Federal Technology Transfer Legislation and Policy, the Green Book, and update editor of the FLC ORDA Handbook, a comprehensive guide for Office of Research and Technology Applications personnel. Bob is a retired Army Judge Advocate, having several tours as legal counsel at four major medical centers in the Army's Medical Command Headquarters. Please join me in welcoming Bob Charles. Hello. And good afternoon. Welcome to all of you. I'm sorry that uh, we aren't going to have a chance to meet in person in Cleveland. Uh, thanks to Samantha uh, and to Sarah, who are from the FLC, and Samantha from Sandia for uh, being on with me today. Uh, this is the first time that we've done uh, a material transfer agreement um lesson or uh, whatever whatever you want to call this activity today and i want to give you a little background on it because i i think it will fit well into uh, what you're going to participate in i was asked about four months ago to participate in uh, and present on material transfer agreements and i was pretty reluctant to do it because i thought well there's not a whole lot to say about material transfer agreements uh, but the flc persisted and uh, the more i thought about it and the more i worked on the presentation the more interesting it actually got to be uh, today while we are talking to what we what we presume are primarily new people to tech transfer. There's some fairly complex uh, ideas that we're going to talk about. Because this is the first time we've done this presentation, I have no idea how much time it's going to take. Um, and it will depend an awful lot on you out there in the listening audience asking questions to us and getting a discussion going help us to answer your questions. Uh, I look forward to it. Uh, here's our disclaimer. Uh, neither myself nor Samantha represent the, the US government. This is our, these are our own opinions that we're doing. And even the FLC doesn't want to be responsible for us. So why don't we go to the next slide? OK. Um, to start with, uh, MTA, material transfer agreement, is a generic term, and I think this is important for all of you to understand as we move forward. Uh, our intent today was really to consider just uh, MTAs um, between federal labs and non-federal entities, that is, that which we do under the, our tech transfer authority. We're not talking about material transfer agreements that sometimes take place under other uh, funding agreements. 
or intergovernmental transfers. Uh, there, there's just a variety of activities which are labeled as MTAs. Um, and so let's go on to the next one. Here's our agenda for today. Uh, we're we're going to discuss what MTAs are. We're going to talk a little bit about authority, uh, the things that ought to be addressed within material transfer agreements. We're going to talk about uh, UBMTAs, and that will be primarily Samantha, but I'll, I'm probably going to bulge in a couple of times as I'm prone to do. And then again, we'll uh, answer any questions you have, and you are all free to ask questions during the seminar. I prefer that you go ahead and put those in the chat room so we can address them while the issues uh, are alive in your head and not wait. Okay, so why don't we go ahead? What is a material transfer agreement? Uh, we're going to need to take a step back. As it says on the slide, uh, according to the NIST guidance, or according to NIST guidance, a material transfer agreement is something that they have uh, proclaimed to be an other collaborative agreement under the CRATIS statute. And it's a kind of agreement that does not cite the CRATIS statute or doesn't have a research plan. So I'm, I'm going to take a couple steps back here. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. They're located here in Maryland, and they're part of the Commerce Department. The, one of their responsibilities under the Commerce Department is to oversee and manage the federal tech transfer um, program and legislation. Uh, they, they occasionally come out with guidelines un, under the Code of Federal Regulations. And they decided that they needed to um, define what a material transfer agreement was for the purposes of federal tech transfer because uh, every year, as you're probably aware, your lab and your agency report up to through um, other agencies up to Congress about how the federal tech transfer program is running. NIST is responsible for putting together the annual report for the tech transfer operations within the federal government. And there wasn't any place where they could, or any official definition of what an MTA was, or specifically of what an MTA was and how it differentiated from a CRETA since it was being done under CRETA authority. So I've put the citation down at the bottom of this slide so all of you could read the NIST guidance and see how they officially define what a material transfer agreement is or what how it came to be a other collaborative agreement. Let's go on to the next slide, please. This is strictly my opinion, but as I indicated, the purpose of the NIST guidance is to try to standardize the reporting of federal tech transfer activities by agencies to Congress. Uh, the NIST definition of a material transfer agreement makes no sense from a legal, legal perspective. And we'll talk about that later. But again, it's important to realize that those things which were counting as MTAs for the purposes of your annual report uh, are something uh, uh, something that came from NIST for the purposes of standardizing our reporting nationally. Let's go ahead and, uh, well, I wonder if there's any questions yet. Anything out there? I don't see anything in the chat room. 
No. All righty. Why don't we go ahead and go to the next slide? All right. The, the next topic is material transfer agreement authority and why that's needed. Taking a step back, federal agencies that most, if not all of you work for, may not give away federal resources or accept resources from outside sources. We've, we've got somebody's mic that's hot. I wonder if we could uh, check that, everybody, if you could uh, turn off your sound. Appreciate it. Um, federal agencies can't give away their resources or even accept resources from outside sources or even, even other agencies without statutory or other authority. So uh, historically, about the, the time I started uh, with the Army at Fort Detrick, we, we were still seeing a lot of researchers in our labs who would pass along laboratory materials to their colleagues in academia or at other labs or even in industry without having any agreement. And that, that was pretty typical. In fact, I think that that was the standard practice uh, through most of the 1980s and perhaps into the 90s. And I suspect that occasionally we will find researchers who are still doing it now. They don't understand the requirement that there be agreements if we're going to pass those goodies that are in our labs or equipment or other resources back and forth. Researchers want to do research. They don't like us bureaucrats who slow down things. So, uh, but under federal law, they, you, you need to have some authority to do that. And that authority within the tech transfer world resides with the uh, lab directors or with the, with the uh, military services, the lab commanders. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So that you all understand there is no federal statute, including the CRADA statute, that expressly authorizes material transfer agreements. So this is a, uh, it's a made up category or subcategory of agreements, which falls under other T2 authority. Now, th this is important. And for those of you that are working in our tech transfer uh, offices, you will on occasion get documents that cross your desk that come from potential collaborators. They will say, or they'll come from your contracting shop, or they'll come from somewhere, but they will have as a title material transfer agreement. Uh, your responsibility, if this is outside of the boilerplates, the templates that you normally use, it's your responsibility to read that document and try and understand who, who is the party or parties on the other side, and what is the authority under which they want to to trans either transfer something to your lab or they want your lab to send something to them. Again, just because because something calls itself a material transfer agreement, you should not assume that it's being done under the Kratos statute. Uh, you, you, if it's something other than what you're accustomed to seeing, it might be coming under a, uh, as part of a contract because your, your one of your labs is trying to buy materials, and the the folks that are selling the materials, besides wanting payment, perhaps under a credit card or however your lab does that, they may require that your leadership or your researcher sign and acknowledge some terms and conditions that will be part of that agreement. Or it might be something from another federal agency 
that would better fit under the interagency agreement personnel at your lab and whoever handles that. So again, it's up to you to look at those and trying to decipher, well, what exactly is this and who's, whose box does this fit in? Because it could be that it belongs to a contract officer or somebody who's got a credit card within the lab. It may belong to the office in your headquarters that does interagency agreements if that's not something you also do. Okay, no questions still? No, nope, doesn't look like it. All right, let's go ahead. There are specific authorities for sharing resources. Two of them are specific to agencies, and one of them to specific agencies, and one of them, the CRADA Authority, is specific to every agency, including NASA, which could also use the Space Act to share materials. And NIH also under the Public Health Service Act, they have authority to send materials, receive materials as part of their research mission. All federal agencies may use the Federal Tech Transfer Act, which is typically what uh, we call the CRADA statute. That's 15 U.S. Code 3710A. Okay, so next. All right. So if we, if we go back to the CRADA statute and look at how our CRADA is defined, you, as most of you are probably familiar with, it says that a federal lab may accept, retain, and use funds, personnel, services, and property from a collaborating party, and that the federal lab may also provide personnel, services, property, and other resources to the collaborating party. Well, this is essentially our authority to transfer materials. And whether your lab calls that a CRADA or calls it an MTA or calls it a Caesar salad, it really doesn't matter. And whether the statute is cited really doesn't matter. Uh, the authority for all laboratories that all of them can use to transfer authority is the CRADA authority. So uh, CRADAs were intended uh, by uh, Congress to be broad and and flexible, to be, a, this is a broad and flexible authority. And a whole number of things can be done under it from rather simple transferring of materials to very complex collaborations. And so it it's a one authority fits many different activities. However, as I said earlier, it for the purposes of your annual counting of how many CRADAs your lab did or how many other collaborating agreements, the NIST guidance will has set forth how we're going to standardize the reporting back to Congress. Okay, you all have that? I hope there's questions because this is going to be one of the quickest seminars of all time otherwise. Okay, let's go to the next one. So here's a digression, and it's an important lesson for uh, new people in a tech transfer office to learn about part of their job. As you read the CRADA statute, it, it doesn't mandate a bilateral exchange of resources. And what I mean by that, in case it's not clear, is the, the CRADA statute doesn't say that both sides must give resources to each other in order for this to be a CRADA. 
So it doesn't mandate that. I know that there are uh, some agencies and some labs that re require that it be, they take that word uh, cooperative to mean more than Congress intended. The parties are cooperating, but they're just cooperating and moving R&D forward. It doesn't mean that the two sides are cooperating by both giving materials to each other. It can be one way, okay? Here's something else that the CRADA statute does not mandate that agreements under the statute cite the statute. I, I hope that wasn't too complicated, but if you have an agreement where your lab is going to be giving out materials and the other side is going to be doing some research and perhaps sending back the results, that can be signed off by the parties and be legal and just fine without having a citation of authority. And the example I use is when you go to McDonald's and buy your Happy Meal, it's not essential for that agreement to be a contract that you receive a copy of um, the, you know, the state commercial code, the federal commercial code, the constitution and the bill of rights. You don't have to have anything that cites the law in order to enter into a, a statute, into a binding contract. It's only for the purposes of it being a valid uh, agreement under the CRADA statute, you just have to follow the four squares of what the CRADA statute does require, and that is that there be a, a at least one federal lab and one non-federal entity, that they be exchanging resources, one or the other or both exchange resources, and it's supposed to be toward a R&D specified activity uh, that it supports the mission of the laboratory. So that's about all that's really needed. Excuse me, I'm gonna move myself. The light is moving in my house. The sun is coming through. So third, um, th there's nothing in the law that mandates that labs use their own template. Uh, I've been involved in thousands of CRADAs and material transfer agreements, probably over 7,000 in the last 20 years. And it's not infrequent that we get templates from outside organizations, from nonprofit organizations, um, from whoever we're working with, they often use their own template. And that is fine as long as it meets the definitions of a CRADA under the CRADA statute. Sometimes your lawyers uh, get adamant that, well, we have to cite the CRADA statute in order for this to be lawful. That's not so. It just needs to fit the definition of a CRADA. It doesn't have to cite the CRADA statute. Uh, also, the CRADA statute doesn't define the different, I put down there different kinds of CRADAs, but it, the different kinds of agreements that can be done under the statute. And what I mean by that is uh, we can use the CRADA statute to do non-disclosure agreements, to do what's called material transfer agreements, to do complex collaborations with non-federal entities, to do all kinds of uh, activities with others. We can even hold and, and co-sponsor seminars with certain non-federal entities under the CRADIS, using the CRADIS statute. And the CRADIS statute doesn't say, well, these are the kind you should do. It simply defines what a CRADA is, indicates who has the authority, it, it allows the labs to both bring in resources, including money, and to give out certain resources, but no money. 
um, but it doesn't it doesn't try to define every pro potential use of a crater. And this is actually something wonderful that Congress has done, is that they've allowed us this great and flexible authority so that we could do all kinds of activities to help move our mission along and help uh, the United States uh, also in its com be uh, on the cutting edge of technologies that involve something that we're doing in our labs. And so it, it's really a, a great thing, but it's good for you to understand from your position uh, that, that some of the labs and some of the agencies tend to overdo it in their templates, they either mandate the use of their template when that's not necessary, or put other conditions in their agreements, which may not be overall necessary in order to accomplish the mission of the lab and to get into uh, effective uh, agreements with others. Uh, lastly, as part of this prolonged digression, the CRATA statute doesn't define what a research plan or statement of work is. If you remember our earlier slide where the uh, NIST has has defined a, a material transfer agreement as one of those other collaborative agreements, uh, and they're ones that don't have a research plan or statement of work in them. Well, the the statute doesn't define what that is, what those research plan or statement of work is. So. Most of us, I think, in our common practice, in what we usually see is the legal part of the, the agreement up front, the terms and conditions. And then we have some kind of statement of work or research plan in the back indicating how resources are going to go back and forth and which party is going to do what. Well, it's fine to do it that way, but it could also be incorporated in some other part up front in, in the CRATA itself. So it's not required that it uh, fit into under the law to, to be in a certain format. So if you're working with a, a potential collaborator who does things in different ways and wants to use its own um, template, well, legally, that's just fine. And I, you may need to push your, your legal reviewer some, and you may need to go hold the hand of your lab director who's not used to seeing uh, something on a different format. But those are legally fine and can be used and should be used if they are otherwise legal agreements. You, you'll want to look at your agency regulations and past practices. Again, I'm not. Uh, asking that you go in open rebellion, um, you, you'll want to see what makes sense and what is really required versus what's just been the past practice and what works best in a particular situation. One of the things that differentiates perhaps our practice with the labs I work with is we are very, very flexible. We are, we want to just do what's needed to fit the requirements of the law and not slow down potential research for months and months while we go back and forth with our collaborating parties over issues that really legally don't matter. So uh, that that's something that uh, we have as part of our practice. I know that there are other labs that think the same way. Unfortunately, there are some agencies that are more sticklers and don't show as much flexibility. And I think that in the end, that just ends up hurting your programs uh, because it slows down the work as the parties get, get stuck over having the, their agreements look in a particular way instead of just fulfilling the mandates and requirements of the statute. No questions yet. Are you guys caffeinated sufficiently? Are you with us here today?
Hi, Bob. There are some questions waiting for you in your chat box. Okay, well, let's, uh, you know what? I don't see them. Okay, curious. Is there any type of tech transfer agreement used by federal labs that does require citing the statute? I, I don't know of any. Um, no, but I, I don't know of any that really require that a statute be cited. That's, uh, I, I think that that's something, you know, we, we get into practices and the lawyers, things that the lawyers are comfortable with, but I can't think of any reason for it. Here's another one. Okay, it says, always great to see you, Bob, or whoever that is, bless you. Uh, what do you think of some agencies using transfer of material creators where they combine some initial research to the exchange of materials under an MTA? Well, <clears throat> I think it's fine because I don't get hung up in what the document is called. I review what what the party what the parties intend, and I want to make sure that there's no other violations of the law. For example, I'm not going to let them get away with um, making the agreement under their their particular state's law or the jurisdiction of their particular state's court, just as an example. But I don't. I don't care what it's called. And you, you've got to, you know, I, I know that lots of labs and lots of agencies uh, put different names on their agreements to fit whatever their purposes are, and that's fine. I, again, legally, I don't think it makes any difference. Where it may get a bit complicated for some of you is, well, what do we report up to NIST at the end of our year, what do we report? We report up as CRATAS, and what do we report up as other collaborative agreements? And I think that's where it gets a bit complicated for some. Uh, I don't get involved in the reporting up to NIST. Uh, from my legal standpoint, it doesn't make any difference. I know it, it's probably a headache for many of you to try and figure out just how many agreements you've got. Uh, we've got, we do hundreds of material transfer agreements. We do maybe 150 non-disclosure agreements. We don't count the non-disclosure agreements as far as I know. We don't count those at all in what we um, tell NIST that we've done. Although those are, those are agreements that we've entered into under create authority because we don't have any other authority under which we can enter non-disclosure agreements, which are contracts. And what, what you're transferring really is information, either mutually or, or unilaterally. And in my mind, they're a CRADA. They fit the definition of a CRADA. Uh, but we've never thought it right to count those for the purposes of our annual reporting up to NIST. I see something up here, let's see. Hi, Bob, this is Amy Shim from mtashare.net. Hi, Amy, uh, Amy and I shared emails earlier. So in your experience, do most labs utilize their own MTA, except when they use a UBMTA instead of standardized template like NIST, Autumn, Open MTA, single letter agreements. Uh, are there any plans to standardize agreements among the FLC? Uh, let me take, uh, Amy, let me take that one handful at a time. Uh, in my experience, most labs do utilize their own template, at least when they're, they're initiating, uh, they're the first one to send the agreement unless the, uh, <clears throat> in, unless the collaborating party has sent their agreement. I really don't know uh, how most labs respond if they insist on using their template or not. That would be an, uh, 
a good question. In fact, I'd like to get some feedback from those of you in attendance about whether your labs are okay with using the templates from your commercial partners or from other federal organizations. Uh, it would be good to know. If you, if you want to put in something in the chat, please uh, let me know. I'd be interested in that. Uh, we, uh, we, answering that question again, we don't have a standardized template. Within the Department of Defense, there was some effort a few years back to come up with a um, standard template for a CRADA. And I was a part of that effort. I was on the committee. But I warned the folks up at uh, the DOD transfer, uh, tech transfer office, and those who I participated with, that, that um, although I was happy enough to help, the labs I work with do not have a one-size-fits-all uh, template among th themselves. I let our labs modify their templates because they tend to have recurrent issues with others. And so what I want, I just want to make sure that their templates are legal. I don't care if they look like each other. So I'm not, um, uh, it, it, I'm, I'm only a fan of standardization if you really and truly have to do that because your legal reviewers haven't got the mental flexibility to deal with changes. Um, I'm, I don't mean to be rude by that, well, maybe I do mean to be rude by that. Um, but uh, again, I think that the statute provides and intends that there be a lot of flexibility. And as long as it fits the needs of the research mission and is not illegal, we should be able to use variations on our own templates and other people's templates. So. Uh, I don't know of any plans, Amy, uh, for a standardized agreements among the FLC, and I don't think that would ever work because uh, some labs are less flexible than others. And um, my observation, um, working with other agencies for these 20 years, is that those agencies and military services that insist on using a standardized agreement also have the least productive and efficient and effective tech transfer programs. And agreements tend to get stuck in negotiations for months on end, and they tend to lose a lot of potential uh, collaborative partners because of insisting that the agreement has to look in one particular way in order to be acceptable to their uh, agency or their lab. And uh, I've seen that pretty consistently. I think that the secret to having a nimble and successful tech transfer program is not only having wonderful and talented people in the tech transfer offices, but having attorneys who have the capability of quickly looking at the documents, determining whether it, it otherwise fits the needs of the laboratory and is legal and lawful, and just going with it. So again, just my opinion. Let's see if there are any more questions. OK. Um, what about material? transfers used for a strategic partnership proposal where an industry partner sponsors a lab's researchers to perform certain research. It is not a CRADA, but often requires an MTA. Wow, this one is, uh, okay. 
what about material transfer used for strategic partnership proposal? You know, I need more explanation. Whoever provided this, um, Sarah, um, if, uh, if, if you could get on or provide more information in the chat, I don't quite understand what a strategic partnership proposal is. So. Hi, Bob. That question is from Sheridan. And if they um, choose to, they can follow up in the question box and I'll forward it to you immediately. Super. Again, I, uh, if, if I, we could have a bit more explanation of what that is so I understand it. Um, they want to do certain research, um, I guess. This, well, again, I, I'd like a little bit more detail before I uh, give an opinion. Okay. Here's one that's going to be for Samantha. Has any DOE lab encountered an issue of their DOE site office asking for the review and approval of MTAs? No. <laughs> uh, Under, yeah, we do not go to the field office for MTAs. Um, we have permission through our managing and operating contract to enter into bailment agreements, um, and it does not require any sort of additional approval. Okay, I hope I hope uh, DOE person that that answers the mail. All right, here's another one. In your opinion, what is the bare essential for an MTA? In other words, you mentioned that you try not to waste time on the issues that do not legally matter. What are the issues that legally matter in your opinion? Okay. Well, I, I'm going to be shooting from, from um, the hip. I hope I don't miss anything. Uh, the, it's going to need to indicate who the parties are. Um, it's going to need to indicate what the materials are. If there's, uh, if whoever is giving the materials wishes to have some limitations on their use, for a particular purpose, you know, that if you take a step back, my lab or one of my labs can enter into an MTA to give materials to X company, and we could just say, here, it, it's for research. Uh, it's a, or it's for research on um, malaria. But without being more specific, malaria is a huge field. Are we looking at a, a back? Seen? Are we looking at a therapeutic? Uh, what What's it used for? Uh, and are there any limitations on it? There, you know, it can be a fairly bare agreement if the organization giving the materials really doesn't care about what it's used for. But then that begs the question, and the, these uh, is in our our next slide, which is I think most of you can see, is what what things need or should be addressed depends a lot on the facts on the ground. Um, so, uh, what happens, for example, at Samantha and I in our material transfer agreements, we're we're dealing with sometimes with biologics or chemical compounds. What happens, is the other party allowed to modify those or are there limitations on that? Uh, are, are our labs gonna send that without shipping costs? Because we, if it's something that's going to be expensive, it, we can agree that, you know, the other side will pay, they may not pay our lab, because if they do, it will be outside of the tech transfer authority, but they could arrange for a, a logistics, you know, Fed, Fed Express, um, 
uh, somebody, the postal service, to pick it up and take it, and then they have to pay for the cost. So how is that addressed? Uh, because of the nature of the materials, we may have some. We think that it's best to have indemnity involved. You know that if if these are potentially dangerous materials in some ways, uh, or if, for example, there if we ship vaccines uh, to another party for their use in a clinical trial. Well, we may want to make sure that they have some kind of insurance to protect the U.S. government in case something goes wrong. Uh, there's uh, usually, but not always, um, concern about intellectual property rights. So again, it it depends on the facts on the ground. What's being, if this is material that uh, there is no I, particular IP rights uh, because the the stuff maybe had a, was on patent 30 years ago, but is off patent now. Well, you don't need to include that, but you may want to have something if a new invention comes out of the use and what rights the government would have. For any new invention, uh, there are issues about publications, uh, material re returning or destroying the materials when it's done, uh, maintenance. If we give a piece of equipment or we receive a piece of equipment, what are the obligations for maintaining that equipment during the the period of performance? How do we handle disputes if those arise? Uh, what laws apply, et cetera? So to answer your question, you know, I, I have seen material transfer agreements that were fairly simple because of the nature of the exchange and what was being sent and whether the folks on the other side cared. For example, we we've, we've had them um, non-federal entities or universities send us pieces of equipment or materials, and they just really didn't care anymore. They they were passing title over to us, essentially, for those materials. And so the material transfer agreement could be fairly simple, but it would need to say explicitly that the, that the recipient is accepting title and the sender is uh, giving up title to those materials. And, those are issues that would need to be addressed. Samantha, did you want to say something about modifications? Um, no, I mean, particularly for biologicals, if the point of the MTA is to make modifications, it's important to understand who owns those modifications, how they can be used, if they need to be destroyed with the original material. Um, so it's just something to think about um, when you're in a transfer material, what if they modify it? Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, I've got another question. Who at the federal lab should sign a MTA? Does it need to be signed by the federal lab? Is it sufficient to be signed only by the non-federal recipient? Uh, I, I would say that the director signs it if we go back a few slides, remember that a, an MTA is being done under CRADA authority. You may not put Cooperative Research and Development Agreement or use the acronym CRADA in the agreement, but that's the authority it's being done under. And under that statute, it is the director of the lab who um, is allowed to enter agreements, so it's not a it's not the interested scientist that does it. And since, as I said earlier, the labs need authority both to bring in materials from non-federal entities and to give away government property, and those materials are government property. I would suggest strongly that your lab director sign the agreement or if at your lab somebody else has been delegated authority to sign them that that individual sign so um it, it, 
it, th there's an interesting e question right at the end. This is sufficient to be signed only by the non-federal recipient. Um, I would say that if you have a file that you keep on all of these and you have something in writing, you being the tech transfer office, you have an email or something in writing that said uh, our director, Dr. X, approved us sending these materials to that recipient, and it, it could be an email. Well, if you have that, I would say you'd be okay. Uh, that, uh, that would be fine because there's nothing that the, in the law that says that they have to. I think it's a better practice uh, that both parties have a signature to it. But I don't think it's necessary as long as there's some other evidence that you have in the file in case the question arises later about was this approved? Uh, how do we know it was approved uh, by the right authority within our lab to send these materials off to a company? Uh, again, most of the time it, it won't matter. But we're hoping actually the reason we're in this business is we hope that it does matter. We hope that when we send materials off to somebody else, that they put it to good use on for some purpose that fits within our mission. And uh, that if there's an invention, et cetera, that we don't find ourselves in some kind of legal dispute. So better to have a signature though legally. I don't think it's required, required. Okay. This is Sheraton. This is my next question. This is Sheraton at Berkeley Lab. Hello, Sheraton. Uh, so you know, I am a Berkeley bear. Uh, and that probably happened before you were born. It was a long time ago, but I'm a Berkeley graduate. We have basically two types of research agreements, strategic partnership proposals, and CRADA. Strategic partnership proposals are a contract with an industry-sponsored partner. I noticed Samantha has in her bio that she works on SPPs and CRADAs and wonder if she would provide some clarification for you as I thought there were standards across all the national labs. Samantha, you want to run with this? Sure. Um, so at least for the DOE labs, we have DOE orders that give us our standard SPP and CRADA templates. Um, we typically do not do MTAs in combination with CRADAs and SPPs because you know all of the material transfer is taken care of, taken care of within those agreements. Um, so you know we we use that one one document to um, determine what's going to be transferred and why under the SVP or CRADA. Okay, could you, just for, for my education, could you explain what a, a industry sponsored agreement is? Is that done under authority other than CRADA authority? Is that something else that DOE has, some other authority? I believe so, yes. Um, it is, uh, we actually try, we've actually tried to figure out where the SPP authority comes under. Um, it's not CRADA, it's an, an other collaborative agreement, I believe. All right. um, mm -hmm. And the difference is, you know, CRADAs are cooperative. Um, SPP is more like uh, a singular, the lab is going to do the work and there's going to be no cooperation. So for instance, an industry partner, which is the funding source, is going to pay Sandia to run tests. Yeah. Um, Sandia is going to return the results to the funding source or sponsor. Um, so Sandia will be the only entity doing the work, unlike a CRADA where both entities are typically cooperative and doing the work together. All right. Yeah. Sheraton uh, indicates that that these SPPs used to be called work for others. Yes. And uh, other 
other agencies like the Department of Defense has a work for other statute also that that we use under a different set of rules. It's not a CRADA. Uh, it requires a full, uh, both direct and indirect cost reimbursement. We, mm -hmm. we are not doing this for invention invention purposes. It's just a plain old, we're hiring ourselves out because we happen to either have the facilities or expertise that others don't. And I, I think that that's what's going on with DOE also. It's exactly right. Okay, here's another question. What is the most common reason for a proposed MTA not to be finalized? Legal terms versus cost versus time to complete negotiations. You know what, I'm going to, to need to uh, tell you that that probably is lab and agency specific. I've done, as I indicated, thousands of these and i i bet in those thousands of agreements we don't have more than uh, at the most 10 but i'm thinking more like five that they weren't finalized and this goes back to the way we do our practice uh, that we're flexible we reach out quickly we find out where the where the differences are um, uh, but that may not be the case where you are whoever asked that question we have um we we do have legal issues that come up and you know understandably for example when we're dealing with foreign entities or foreign governmental entities and we we do a lot of uh, agreements in our uh, labs with foreign government entity, foreign governmental entities like ministries of defense or uh, uh, health uh, or just foreign entities, they they naturally want to um, put in case of dispute that their laws apply and their courts have jurisdiction. As you've probably figured out, all of you have figured out, we, we can't agree to that. So we work with them and say, well, we can leave this blank, but we certainly can't put that the, the, the laws of Uganda are going to apply and your courts are gonna have jurisdiction. We just don't do that uh, because the Department of Justice re represents us in legal disputes and uh, they'll have our necks if we agree to such a thing. And they won't agree to it even if, we, if our commander is signed because we're the United States and we have sovereign immunity and any actions brought against us, at least in negligence, uh, has to be brought under the Federal Tort Claims Act or the Foreign Claims Act and federal courts are, and their rules are gonna hear. Now, going a step backwards, having been involved in thousands of these agreements, Occasionally, we'll have companies that say, well, okay, we'll agree to federal courts, but we want them to be the federal courts in our state. Let's say the state of Washington or the state of Arizona or whatever. Well, I don't care. Uh, you know, I, I could only wish to go spend some time in Arizona uh, if, if there was a suit. We don't get many suits that happen under these things. Again, uh, I've I've done a couple of presentations for the FLC and for DOD audiences on tech transfer litigation, and there just really isn't a whole lot of it. And most of these are fairly or extremely low risk for litigation. So if it's going to go to a court in a foreign, excuse me, outside of, in my case, outside the state of Maryland or District of Columbia, I don't care. That's no big deal for us. Um, you know, that's interesting. I wonder if others might want to respond to that question of within your practice, what are the most common reasons uh, for, for MTAs not to be finalized? Is your template too complex and too much legal stuff in there and it scares people away? Uh, 
Does it take too long for your legal folks to review these and negotiate? What are the hangups that are causing you problems? Okay. All right, let's see if there are more questions. I like these questions. Thank you so much. When dealing with foreign countries, can we agree to foreign country law and jurisdiction for defending party language? We, we've actually done that um, at a few times. That is, uh, uh, but this is our practice. Your lawyers may have a problem with it. But what have, we've essentially said, it so that you understand what's going on here, is let, let's say that we have an agreement with a company from France. And the, the folks on the French side, let's say it's a pharmaceutical company, they're trying to insist that if there's a dispute, it would have to be settled under French law and uh, under the jurisdiction of French courts. We're going to hold on a minute. What happens uh, in my house, I have some windows way up above, and as time changes, the light changes. And I've been moving this, this over to the right. Now I just moved it to the left, so I won't be sitting in the sun and there won't be a bad reflection. Sorry for that. So going back to our French partners, uh, what we've occasionally brought out is that, okay, here's the deal. We'll agree that if we're going to sue you, we'll sue you in French court. And if you're going to sue us, you have to do it in U.S. court and U.S. laws. And again, uh, if we're going to sue them. And I agree to this because I think that the odds of anything in my business coming out of it are so minuscule. And the importance of the research going on is so much more important that it that we're willing to do that because we just don't ever foresee that situation arising. I don't know if I can, uh, as a blanket statement, say that for you and your labs that you should do that because it really depends on what the materials are. I won't do it for all materials. Let's say we're, we, um, we have some materials that we think are very valuable uh, for the next generation COVID vaccine. And in fact, that just happens to be the case. And in fact, it, it's the case that might be uh, for any vaccine that comes out. We have something that we put with vaccines called an adjuvant, and we think we have one that's very effective. We've done a number of agreements uh, with people uh, around the country and around the world with it. Uh, I'm I'm not going to advise our lab that it's okay that we accept a foreign court or foreign laws in case we want to bring an action against them. We're going to insist if we're going to send them those materials that it's going to be a U.S. court and U.S. laws, and that they're going to be willing to subject themselves to it because. This partic that particular material is too important for us, or that particular CRADA collaboration in terms of what we might stand to lose. So again, this is why <clears throat> it's really important for you, for you legal advisors out there to understand the mission of your laboratory and what things really are important to what you're doing and what things perhaps are not so important. If these are materials that you don't care that much about, they're off patent, or um, you, you've got so much of the IP tied up that, and, and you've got it tied up in, uh, in foreign countries also, that it's not an issue, well, you might consider it. But you, you really need to understand as a lawyer, and, and it helps to understand this as a tech transfer professional, what are the implications of this particular material? What's it used for? Is this really cutting edge stuff that we are looking for as a platform for other technologies? 
well, that, that might make a real big difference as to who we want to send this to and what potential uses we allow with it, whether we allow it to be modified at all or just be used as is in a particular way. Samantha, do you want to say something about that? Sure. I mean, we um, we have done that a few times as well, the place of the defendant, because Sandia doesn't typically sue. Um, but we've never not entered into an MTA for you know jurisdictional reason. Um, actually, I don't recall a time when we've ever not entered in to an MTA because of legal reasons, we can typically negotiate what we need to, yeah. so we can move it forward. Thank you. I, I have a, another question here, which is a, a good one, and I saw it from another source. I wonder if this is, a, the, I got one of these just recently, is should the gov US government always retain ownership of joint inventions? Well, under the statute, under the CRATA statute, if you're going to do a material transfer agreement or other form of CRATA, if we're going to either license or assign that invention over to our collaborating party, the U.S. government maintains a non-exclusive right to use that for material for government purposes. So. I don't I don't think it's important that the US government always retain ownership. Let's say that um, again, it's important for you as tech transfer professionals, as IP counsel, if we have some out there and you would understand this perhaps a little better, or if you have other attorneys who are advising you who aren't IP counsel, that you look at well why might our collaborating party want to have exclusive ownership? Uh, when, and when I say exclusive, that is except for the government purpose license that is required under the statute. And in many situations, if, if they're going to need to go outside and find outside investors to help them uh, move that technology along, the outside investors will be very interested in knowing who owns the rights to these materials or to this invention. And if it's something that the U.S. government co-owns and, and has unlimited rights to, to use, as we have here in the United States, that's not true in Europe and other places, but it's true here in the United States, if we co-own um, uh, a technology, uh, a piece of intellectual property, a patent, that means that we, there, unless we otherwise agree, there's no strings attached, we can deal with who we want. Or going back to that uh, other party we're dealing with, they may not be able to get the resources they need to move that technology along to commercial, commercialize it because uh, the early stage investors and other investors are not going to put their own money into it uh, where the US government still has so much flexibility if they want to. So there is no one size fits all. And I'd say sometimes we do want to keep joint ownership, uh, joint of, uh, or of joint inventions. and. Sometimes we really don't care. So it depends on the invention. Uh, it depends on what the potential uses are. It depends on whether we are uh, licensing rights out as opposed to assigning our rights, total rights uh, to title, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, you, you have to look at the whole picture, which is why it's important to have. Uh, a, a good legal advisor there with you to walk through and look at the implications and also to be able to talk to your scientists about what other potential uses you've got or may have for those materials in the future. 
And you could always just license it for limited uses, a field of use or, or a geographical area of use. You can give exclusive uses in Europe or parts of the United States or the whole world except the United States. So there's a whole lot of variations on this that you might want to explore with your legal counsel, with your leadership in the lab and say, what do we care about? What's important to us? Okay, another question. Would it be possible to receive funds under an MTA? Yes, it would. Uh, no reason why you couldn't. If you're going to be doing research for the other party, uh, and then they're, they're giving you the materials uh, to do work, or, now this is, this is going to sound pretty wild, but you could have an MTA where the other party all that's being exchanged is they're giving you money to do research. They have, uh, let's say that they're in a particular field, uh, uh, they're a nonprofit that wants to see research done in a particular area, or for whatever reason, they're more interested in the end result of the research and the potential collaboration of a technology than in anything else. And what they've got is money past funds. Well, historically, for example, NIH wouldn't allow this. And I've seen other agencies who wouldn't allow just for the transfer of money under a material transfer. agreement. But there's that's not required by the law. The law would allow just for the, for the transfer of funds over to the lab to carry out certain research. And again, it, there may be some you know, agreement to give a report back of the research or, uh, you know, further steps that are needed. That there's, a, there's a number of variation depending on the facts on the ground and what people are contemplating. Okay, I hope I answered that. Next, is it, is it common to use unique MTA templates if data is being sent versus other tangible materials. You know, that depends uh, whoever asked that um, um, on, uh, uh, for example, in the field I am where we're often getting involved with clinical, human clinical data, um, then there, there are unique federal laws that apply and uh, within the realm that I work, uh, we have our Defense Health Agency has regulations on uh, data sharing agreements involving clinical data. So it depends on the field you're working in. Uh, otherwise, if it's simply data, um, to me, that's just material. Data is material. So you'd have to look at what your practice has been within your agency to see whether historically they've had different kinds of agreements for the data that they might send. There, there may be particular laws, uh, export laws or other laws that might apply that need to be uh, added to your template to make sure that the other party is put on notice about potential uses of that data. Again, I hope I've answered your question. S Samantha, anything about uh, unique MTA templates if it's data versus other tangible materials? So at Sandia, we only use MTAs if it's a biological material, um, sometimes a chemical composition. We don't use MTAs to transfer anything else besides those two very narrow um, materials. If we're going to share um, a, a device or an apparatus, we use a bailment. If we're simply going to share information or data, we typically use a non disclosure agreement. For, for yeah. those who may not be familiar, could you explain what a bailment is? It's just like an MTA, only it's called a bailment, and it's for materials that are not biological that we would likely get returned. 
Um, for a material transfer agreement, we typically assume that the biological is going to get used up or destroyed. For a bailment, we'll typically expect to get the device returned. Great. So they're very similar. It's just the All type right. of material that we transferred, yeah. Here, here's another question that, and it might be good for both of us to answer, and I think I'll let you go first. It is, how is IP usually handled under an MTA if the federal lab is transferring a biological invention, for example, a vaccine product to a non-federal entity? And then it says, under the FTTA, I assume that inventors of that vaccine product would have the option to retain their invention ownership, but that does that apply also to any data that comes out of that MTA crater? I'm not sure, can you read, uh, is this in your feed also? Can you see this question? Yes, it looks like I can see the question. Um, in our MTAs, we retain the rights of material that we sent, explicit in the material transfer agreement. Um, modifications are negotiable. Um, you know, we like to understand what the modifications they make are. Um, if they're inventing a modification, it, it becomes complicated. It could end up being joint ownership. Um, but we, we always explicitly state that whatever we're transferring you know, Sandy, if there's IP involved, Sandia retains ownership of that. Yeah. We're, we're pretty much the same that we, we maintain the rights, any existing IP rights in anything that we're sending. Uh, we, you know, we, we give them a license to do research with the materials because that's why we're sending the materials that they're, so that they'll do some research with it. But we don't, we don't release our IP rights to them. And then if there is an invention that arises out of it, it depends on the situation. Again, this is under the CRADA law, they have certain rights. If they invent something, they're going to own it. But we may agree in advance, you know, to say, we're only gonna send you our stuff that if you invent, make an invention using this stuff, that the parties will co-own that invention, and the parties can negotiate, you know, what, you know, how any invention patent will be filed, for example, and how to go forward with further development if that's what the parties want to do. So it really depends on what is it we're sending and what we intend with it and how important it is. Um, again, and this is somewhat like Kratos, that we have to look at the whole picture. What is it? What are we, why are we sending it to them? What rights are in it? Um, one thing to re remember, if you're sending materials to someone and they are going to need that invention to go forward with the ultimate manufacture and commercialization, that they're going to have to get a license from you in order to use that for something for the manufacturing and selling and perhaps exporting of that technology because you own the IP. So you need uh, someone wise enough with IP to understand the implications of the work. Okay. Let's, um, man, this took a lot more time than I thought, but that's good. Do most agencies ensure that their MTAs are in agreement with S&T agreements with foreign countries? USDA has standardized language that we are required to incorporate into the MTA. I am just wondering how other agencies handle S&T agreements. Wow. Um, <clears throat> for foreign countries. Well, I, I guess I'd have a question to whoever asked this, um, whether 
we're talking about agreements with foreign governmental entities or just foreign companies. Uh, when we do agreements with foreign governmental entities, what we we have some standard language that we picked up. Uh, well, this would have been about 12 years ago. I negotiated this with the Department of State, um, and they we agreed to certain language that we weren't tying our uh, government to any particular agreement outside of this one. We weren't. This wasn't going to be precedent. The U.S. the international laws do not apply, and that U.S. law does apply. So uh, we have um, that you know that language that we use in both our MTAs and CRATAs when we're dealing with foreign governmental entities. I wonder how um, Sarah, how could we get this question out? to those who are attending and they can respond to it to whoever asked uh, from the Department of Agriculture. Hi, Bob, that's a great question. Um, in our survey that will be emailed out to you, if you would like to follow up, uh, there will be an additional comments box. And um, John Iceman actually asked this question, so I can personally follow up with him with any of the feedback that we received that way. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, of course. Sarah, Sarah also warned me that we've got about 10 minutes left. I'm uh, astounded we've still got 111 of you. Why don't we go on to the next slide and we'll see if we can finish any issues uh, we haven't addressed. Go ahead. Go ahead, Sarah, talk about UBMTAs. So, the UM, UBMTA is the Uniform Biological Material Transfer Agreement. Um, several hundred academic institutions, many, many academic institutions and private organizations have adopted and signed this master UBMTA. It's also promoted by the NIH and Autumn. Um, so, if the recipient and provider entities that want to exchange materials are both UBMTA participants, then a simple UBMTA implementing letter is used. It's a very, very easy way to transfer materials under an MTA because it's just a simple one page letter can be used. Um, I know for Sandy National Labs, we are signatory under the UBMTA, so we can exchange materials <laughs> through, through the UBMTA. It's a very popular mechanism for material transfer agreements. I think we only have one more slide. All righty. So there are also other online service providers. Um, the, I think the largest one is probably AdGene. It's a global nonprofit repository that was created to help scientists share plasmids, which are DNA-based research reagents. Um, so when you know biological papers are published, plasmids can the plasmids discussed in the papers can be deposited with AdGene. And then other scientists can have easy access to those plasmids. Um, more and more publishers are requiring the, their authors' plasmids be deposited through AdGene, so it's it's becoming um, becoming sort of mandatory for publications. And in this case, what AdGene does is the scientists would ship their plasmids to AdGene just once, and then AdGene does the rest. It takes care of all the quality control. Um, it does their own MTA agreements with recipients. It does all the shipping and it does all the record keeping. So it's kind of nice for research scientists that don't want to have to do all this on their own. All they have to do is ship it to Agene and they'll take care of the rest. Agene takes care of the rest. Um, Sandia also uses Agene for many of their scientists um, that do biological research, um, particularly for the publication reasons that I explained. Um, that way, you don't have many different um, requesters coming to Sandia asking more about the publication or the plasmids discussed. They just go to Agene. OK. And yeah. there, NIH has, has contracted 
with a, a number of other organizations to act as repositories for certain types of biologicals. Um, and we do agreements with them all the time. Uh, again, if they are charging for those biologicals in order to be a, a not-for-profit in order to just pay their costs, then uh, that is probably not under the Tech Transfer Act because we're paying for it. They may, and they call their agreements material transfer agreements, but that it's not, it's not one under Tech Transfer. It's it's simply an agreement. It's a it's a contract, but there are certain terms and conditions that the recipient is agreeing to. Why don't we go on to the next uh, slide, which probably just says questions. Uh, I have a favor to ask all of you who are nice enough to stay through all this. Uh, because we've never done this before, I'm really curious about whether uh, this was useful for you, whether there were things that were missing, whether you had questions that weren't answered. Um, whatever, whatever suggestions you have and feedback you have, I'd really appreciate it if you give it to us so we could consider whether we we want to do this again next year, whether we want to have a, if we ever meet together at the FLC, whether I want to do this in addition to the um, CRADA workshop that we use. Uh, appreciate your time, your interest. Uh, I love this work. I'm very passionate about it, and I wish you all the best. Uh, Sarah and Samantha, any closing words? Hi, everyone. On behalf of the FLC, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Bob, Charles, and Samantha Updegraff for sharing your expertise with us. As a reminder, a recording of this webinar will be available uh, for viewing on the FLC Learning Center soon. Please visit our website, federallabs.org, to view the recording uh, or any of our other recorded webinars that you may have missed. Please also remember to complete the webinar evaluation that will be mailed, uh, emailed to you this week. This will help us serve your needs in the future. Thank you so much again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye all.